as he heads across the line as well. More and more cars coming through. Patrick Shipos goes P4. We've got Alpha Tauri's coming across the line as well. Of course, Chana Kinchi and Philip Prejnader being the representatives for that. I believe that is Prejnader who's just crossed the line as well. Jana Watmier goes seventh fastest, just behind his teammate Jake Benham. And uh, we also now have Thomas Ronhar who's coming through bus stop chicane now. Where will he position himself at the start of qualifying here in Q1 at Spa? Immediately to the top, the sole man in the 141s. A 141.955, five thousandths of a second away from the 42s. The Haas is on top. Yeah, that Yarno would have been in a comfortable race lead had he just gone to stay out on the drives. But now he's under severe pressure because here comes Duncan Hoffman. Here comes Thomas Ronner at the same time as well. Side by side, two by two through Blanchemont. Corner contact as they come through Blanchemont. Still side by side. Ronner goes through. Borman trying to find space on the inside. Contact with Hoffman going through there. This is all helping his fan Pukia front. Opmir runs out of room on the way through the final corner. But he will have the inside line for the next part of the corner Borman now senses an opportunity down the inside goes Borman into the first corner but he'll have to now see, see the position surely on the run down towards Oru's corner he doesn't have the run but Borman now this is crucial championship points hanging on through here, here up in towards Blanchemont Oru and Radion up the top of course here comes Luke Smith don't forget about him as well as they head down Borman crucial championship points on offer here on the outside line in the Ferrari has he got the grip to do so? Round the outside of Ronar. He gets it right. And Ronar's round. Ronar's round. He got tapped there slightly by Barry Burman. They came together out of Lacom. Ronar now reduced to P16, the championship leader. Yo, JD here. And as you can see, we are back once again. And. In today's video, it's actually going to be a bit of a follow-up on my last one, and the main discussion of that is whether Thomas Ronha is cheating or not, and a lot of you had some many, many interesting things to say, and in this one here, there's been a lot of events that have kind of transpired within the past week. Um, to do with this situation so we'll be talking about those but before I start as always please make sure you keep your comments uh, nice and respectful make sure you have an open mind because myself my stance pretty much does remain the same it's very very impressive in what Thomas is achieving but I can also see some counter arguments to it and although there are, you could say, many red flags that are being raised right now, I believe there is actually a counter argument to it. And it's not something you can be 100% certain on. So please make sure you have an open mind. And if you do want to comment your opinion, make sure to do it in a respectful way. But as you can see from these clips... The first thing to discuss is the Spa PSGO race that happened last week. And you could see from that race, Thomas Ronha was just absolutely dominant in the qualifying in the Q1 uh, to set that banker of a 41.9 to do a lap he did in Q3. And then in the race, he seemed to be pretty dominant as well until some weather conditions kind of changed the race dynamics. And in that, you saw the likes of Jarno Watmir maybe flexing his elbows a little bit, showing the frustration along with uh, Bari Boromund. And you could see their reaction from Ronha, a pretty null reaction indeed. But that kind of leads me to discussing that. The response from Ronha ever since a lot of people have been discussing this topic has been pretty silent and quite often silence can sometimes be the most deafening of responses so the question i want to ask you is that should thomas ronhart prove that he's legitimate and this is something for me that is actually quite disappointing that we have to question drivers like this question f1 esports drivers being in a position in the first place where we have to maybe have some doubts because if the game was actually constructed properly, 
there was an anti-cheat system in place and the competition was competed on a LAN, then these are things that we would not even be talking about. But I think some of the responses from Ron Ha, you know, with the silence, um, you'll be able to see some other clips a little bit later on in this video. I just don't think that's really doing him any favors for his career because if Ron Har is actually legit and he is doing this 100% clean, then like I said before, it is one of the most impressive driving displays that I have ever seen to be able to perform this consistently and to have a gap to you know, arguably the most competitive F1 esports grid there's ever been and a group of drivers where most of the drivers are doing it on a full-time basis to consistently have gaps such as this is just absolutely sensational and I just feel that if he doesn't say anything and he doesn't want to prove that he is completely clean then if we did arrive at a LAN or if we did have a anti-cheat system installed or no when there's a new game f123 not long until that comes out and his performances aren't matching what he's doing now because he is doing this week in week out at every single track then people will just go accuse him even more and he could actually be legit so i don't know if it's his team advising him or if it's taken it upon himself although it's something you shouldn't have to ask a driver Many people have been putting forward the question, he actually does need to prove it. And my question is, how does he do that? Does he show the processes and applications he runs in the background? Because from speaking to a few people who really do understand how the current F1 cheat or exploit works, you can actually run this from a different device. So it's not actually particularly easy to detect and even when a full-blown test this might not even be able to be detected so let me know what you think needs to happen i think the only answer is that he he goes to a land event or you know goes somewhere but the problem with that again is that if he goes to a land goes to a controlled environment sometimes drivers just don't perform well out of the comfort of their own home and we have seen that with many F1 eSport drivers on in the past who have performed much better on the live stage. But then at home, they don't thrive under that. And other drivers are simply just the opposite. But I think when there is the majority or pretty much a unanimous level of drivers in F1 eSports who are saying these times cannot be achieved, then that's where you really do have to kind of raise the question. Many have pointed out in my last video that Thomas Ronha has already competed on the LAN and therefore he just doesn't need to prove himself. And that is actually correct. He won the F1 Esports Pro Expedition last year. And I think his closest rival was Jake Benham. Without being disrespectful to the other drivers involved because the level was still very high, However, the level is not the same as F1 Esports. And even in this competition, there wasn't really much separation between the likes of him um, and Jake Benham. And I would say Jake Benham was a higher level than Thomas Ronha one to two years ago. But now you can see there is actually quite a significant difference between them. But recently, I think as of yesterday or the day before, there was a race at WR Bahrain and We're headed towards the finish line again. Someone that we know can put in some fantastic performances and look at that. 27-5 from Luke Smith. Great lap from him. He'll be feeling pretty good about how things are going at the moment. Next up towards the line, one of the Alfa Romeos just making his way towards the uh, finish line. Nicholas Longe, not too far away from the end of his lap as well. So De Capua fastest now. On the 127, 534. Andre Tavabukin goes in towards third place. Joseph Loke in fourth. Nicholas Longay towards the line. Puts it in third place on a 127, 
6-3-6 from him. Fantastic lap time. Alvaro Caraton. He's now headed towards the finish line. Winner, of course, earlier on in the season. He's had a couple of bad races. Fourth place, not a bad lap whatsoever for him. You know, the 27-5, 27-6, looking like pretty good lap times. Wouldn't surprise me. If those are good enough to get you through towards Q2. Very well done from him so far. We got Thomas Ronhart now coming up towards the line. Uh, of course, championship leader at the moment. We'll see what he can do as he opens up the DRS and now comes across the line. And he's able to absolutely smash Alessio de Capua's time out of the blue. 1 minute 27.270. Jake Benham only able to muster 1 minute 27.6. I have to Luke in the middle on the 10th and the last. Oh, to Alessio, sorry. <laughs> Okay. Contente, contente. <laughs> Se está intentando contener, tío. <laughs> and as you can see from those clips, the dominance of Ronha over a lap is just simply unmatched and We'll put a few things on the screen here now where we can see some of the differences and also just showing the laps themselves. And this is actually between him and Alessio Di Capua, who was actually a Formula Williams F1 esports driver. And I know that Bahrain is one of his best tracks on the game. The difference is just absolutely insane. Quite similar to the PSGL at Spain. The top speed of Ron Haar was the fastest of anyone in the speed trap. This is in Q1, and he was faster than anyone in the field going down the straight. But again, his ability to get on that power, and in this case, I think the minimum speed, there is actually quite a big difference. Probably the most evident I've seen so far in the minimum speed comparisons in the low speed corners. And again, with a lower downfall setup, which is going to give you speed in a straight line, you wouldn't expect to be gaining time in the low speed corners as well. And even on this lap, I don't think it was even a perfect lap from Thomas. He actually went wide on a couple of these corners, maybe could have hooked it up even better. And the gap was almost three temps clear of anyone else. And you can see the rest of the field there is no shortage of talent here. There are plenty of F1 eSports drivers, plenty of F1 eSports development drivers, and they're quite fairly close together, but the gap he has between them, where Nicholas Longe has even got a pole position in F1 eSports at Bahrain in the past, if I'm not mistaken, is, is pretty crazy, uh, the gap he has. But again, not to say that this is not possible, and... I know some people in the comments have said that this could be a setup exploit, and I guess it could, but if I'm being honest, I think with these setups, we've had this configuration of the setups with the aero, with the transmission, suspension geometry, suspension brakes, and tire pressures. We've had this really for the last five years, the same configuration. The only thing that's changed is that we now have 1 to 50 wings which could be a factor for sure, but I would imagine that almost every combination of setups have been explored, particularly by F1 eSport drivers. It's their job to be as fast as possible. I imagine most components have been explored by now. And the one thing that kind of raises a flag of me as well is, you know, if, it's the case, if it is the case that it is a setup, then why are Thomas's teammates not particularly close to him? Now, in esports, I know Matthias van Erven um, and the, his other teammate, I can't pronounce his name, I know he's Polish, but a very good driver. They weren't on that same level and they weren't particularly close to his times that he managed to do in the qualifying. So surely you'd imagine they would have the same access to these setups, but yet they are not even close to being on the same level. So that for me, that explanation is kind of quite hard to stick with, in my opinion. So yeah, literally, listen up to all the haters in the chat. I won, okay? 
But many people who understand this cheat exploit have detailed that in Q1, this is where you'd be getting most of the benefit because it's the lowest grip scenario. Once the track evolves, then you often see the field come much closer towards what the player can achieve. And back to my question, although it's something that should never be required, I do feel it's in fact in Thomas's interest to actually prove his legitimacy because without recycling what I said in my last video, the competition is at an all time high. And as you can see here, when these drivers unanimously agree that these time cannot be achieved, then something, in my opinion, does need to be addressed. Because if he is doing this legitimately, I think it'll be so impressive for him to show that this is the level that can be achieved. But without this, any drop in pace in future competitions within a controlled environment is simply just going to raise more questions and I think could potentially damage his career in the long term. I'll revert to my conclusion like I did in the first video is why. I know Thomas has actually quit school for this so I imagine the pressure is absolutely insane. But again the risk is just so high because there has to be someone out there who knows what else is going on. It can't just be Ron Hart by himself. There has to be more than one person involved. So the risk of being exposed is just very, very high. And I don't know if it really is worth that risk. But nowadays, it's not just the results that will give you success. But the pressure of your social media presence is arguably even more important to establish a long-term career and its benefits. At the end of the day, as I mentioned, F1 esports should never be performed in an uncontrollable environment. A competition with over $750,000 on the line. I actually find it utterly incredible that they would allow the drivers to play from home with their own PCs. And you can see here, there is no anti-cheat system in place currently, right now. I actually find that quite appalling. I can't even see, or I've never even heard of another esports with a cash prize under £10,000 or dollars that would ever allow this. So I think it's a bit of incompetence from the organizers. Gfinity themselves, who are actually the production company in charge of FN esports, their contract has come to an end which suggests that there will be a new company taking over this. And you can see Thomas here himself suggests there will be a LAN. So I really, really hope that this is something that will happen moving forward. In terms of Ron Hart's legitimacy, I'm not even sure how he could prove this. So in many ways, I can understand his perspective, but to also not comment, not attempt or do anything just I feel doesn't really help himself do any favors in this case but please let me know what you think again please make sure you keep the comments respectful please have an open mind and I'll be catching you very very soon peace